All right. <laughs> so let's just take a couple minutes to take a deep breath and just let go of the day or let go of the night for most of you, I guess. <laughs> I'm just checking in with the body, just with the most obvious things in your experience. Just noticing hunger. What's there when I check for hunger? Thirst. What's already there? If I just drop my awareness towards thirst. tension or comfort in the body? Where do I feel tense? Where do things feel nice? Just letting yourself notice what is obvious without adding anything to your experience, without trying to figure anything out. What's already here? And maybe start extending into the room around you a little bit. Just looking around. Is there anything beautiful or nice or pleasant in the space around you? Is there anything kind of ugly or unpleasant around you? Just checking in with your surroundings. Notice how you feel about them. Without trying to generate any thoughts or feelings about them. What's already there? What naturally stands out? You keep your awareness in your gut and in the space around you. What's already here? <sighs> All right. For me, what's here is I'm now rearing to get going and see what we end up talking about here. So yeah, I'll say my piece first, just what we are talking about. Then we'll go kind of clockwise on my screen to what comes up first around you. Uh, we're talking about Metis today. I've already definitely talked to Matt and Cheryl a bunch about this in various conversations <laughs> around Metis and right hemisphere stuff, respectively. But yeah, our yeah, I'll just read a quote first of all that I'm kind of jumping off from Peter Kingsley describing Metis. He says that Metis is a particular quality of intense alertness that can be effortlessly aware of everything at once. Metis feels, listens, watches, can even be aware at the same time of every thought drifting into and out of our consciousness. It misses nothing. Metis is presence and continuous alertness, a way of being always aware of the whole without excluding anything. So that description was used by Kingsley when he was talking about charioteers and sailors, how there's this really expansive type of awareness that is both like incredibly open and ready to receive anything, and that is aware of all of the individual parts that's really able to just balance all of the parts within the whole and keep all of it going. And there's pretty obvious analogies to Ian McGilchrist's descriptions of the right and left hemispheres of the brain, particularly a really good balance between them. And yeah, Matt, we've definitely talked a fair bit about this. <laughs> but yeah, that open, broad awareness, huge part of the right hemisphere that focus on the whole, the gestalt of everything. And then also a bit of that left hemisphere, like inclusion of what are the parts doing? How can I also keep an eye 
on parts of this whole and keep it all working, keep it all flowing, keep the awareness going. And yeah, so the couple examples that I was seeing of Metis a couple weeks ago when we set this up was uh, improv, particularly the Middle Ditch and Schwartz improv special. Did anyone watch that, by the way? Has anyone seen parts of that? I've only seen the beginning. It looks great. I haven't had time to dive in further, yeah, it's but it's, it is great. Cheryl, I saw you nod. You watched it. And Kenna, what'd you say? Uh, only a couple of clips, only a couple of clips, but I've okay. seen that uh, improv, so. <laughs> yeah, you're good. <laughs> but yeah, what really stood out to me was just how they were, yeah, that same description of just like, as they built the scenario, the hole was very clearly everywhere for them. Like they were keeping the whole picture, the whole story, all the characters in mind. And they were able to jump really effortlessly, literally from part to part. They were changing roles that they were playing back and forth, running around the stage to be first this guy, then this lady, then the other person. And yeah, there was just something really skillful and open and just some other state of mind that really captured me there. And yeah, the only other thing I wanted to note is that Saruman and Radagast article, which feels not like one-to-one -one correlated, but definitely related of like two types of magic in the world. The Saruman's, which are very like technical, left brain, narrow focused, all of that stuff. And the Radagast's who are kind of just like trying out a bunch of things and it flows with natural patterns and they get lucky very often, but that luck is very much like a response to cultivating open, nonlinear possibilities, and then whatever comes out of that. Yeah, so that's the area of stuff that we're kind of talking about here. But yeah, I'm just going to go starting with Matt. What feels present and obvious and clear to you about yeah, this you whole know complex? What jumps out at me right away is that after you read that description, Kingsley's description of Metis, I feel like it is so exciting when that happens for me personally and also so rare. And most of the time, I'm like not even aware that it's possible. But but it was actually kind of sinking in when you did the guided meditation that got us started. And I was making these connections between myself and my inner state and how I'm feeling and sort of registering my presence in this room, jumping back and forth to things that are in the room with me and feeling a sense of relatedness to what surrounds me. Like there's a reason that there's a, a heater right down there by my right foot. There's a reason that there's a piano right <laughs> by my right hand. And it was really interesting because I'm like, wow, this is actually kind of relaxing. Like I should... I should be doing this more often. <laughs> so, um, And I'm still intrigued by this sort of basic project of like trying to build something that feels more like an instruction manual or some, some way to help people get into this state because it feels grounded and creative and uh, healthy in a way that it's just, you know, it's really quite, it's tantalizing to me and interesting to think what if what if there were more on ramps more ways to get into this state of mind yeah for sure i'm struck by the practicality of that which is yeah just very intriguing to me as well mm -hmm. the practical aspects of it feel really mm -hmm. good kenna how about you yeah um i guess even even right now just the idea of wandering the right hemisphere kind of wandering or being lost and as someone who's you know mid-20s uh feeling very lost and is wandering a whole bunch right now uh it feels like you pick up all these different flowers like you're in like this garden or this like big field picking up all these different flowers and it's like oh I need all these flowers <laughs> like and then having kind of like this bag of flowers with me that throughout my life I'm like oh I have this flower for this very specific reason um in a very, very like poetic sense instead of being like okay I need to get to my destination I need to do this and that sort of like rushed feeling of getting somewhere but having nothing with me um at least that's the imagery that comes up for me initially um but yeah very much feel like open awareness <laughs> all the time just kind of really feeling into 
you know, whoever I'm with, whoever kind of is taking up the space. Like I primarily teach, uh, work with children, act on stage in front of people. And there's so much back and forth that is like me presently in my body and the audience, whether that is children or other adults. And it's like, they kind of influence back and forth. And if I completely ignore them, if I tend to be like left hemisphere, this like, I kind of think about the Saruman article where it's like, I exclude them and I'm like, it's all about me, 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 me. And it's like, it doesn't really play out for me. So initially, yeah, all that. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that participatory and like relational aspect is one I always struggle with. It's really good to like hear that at the forefront for you. And Cheryl, what's front and center for you? Definitely the relational dimension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was noticing arriving into the space with all of you, um, even already some of the asymmetries and how intimately I know certain people and how, like, I'm, I'm curious about Matt and Kenna, like, what is your vibe? What is your, like, what colors or sensations or images are evoked as you're speaking? And I think there's like a quality with which when I'm dropping into a kind of ecological yeah, place really. And I think that perhaps the distinction between space and place is place begins to almost like make more familiar the unfamiliar and almost like send roots down into, yeah, like a, a gathering place of bodies and space of voices of awarenesses. And I find that to be really fascinating because when we were dropping into that kind of embodied spatial awareness and noticing what's happening in my body um, and then noticing, oh, I'm in a hotel right now, which is, yeah, I, hotels are weird interstitial um, spatial entities to me. Like they're just... I'm 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 in a hotel that's kind of designed to be homey and cool and hip, but it's still like I don't know. There's this veneer of wanting, like a desire to have, ultimately like a liminal space feel like home. And I and I just find that uncanny valley very strange, mm -hmm. um, but also actually very stirring. Um, and I was noticing that being in New York, being in a city that's not home to me, um, kind of like brings in a little bit of that element of danger that River writes about and that like, I think danger or risk kind of sharpens the metis. Mm. Like you can't just yeah. move around space um, and have that, I guess like spatial awareness be backgrounded you have to be like I'm always looking at where am I what's happening like what's yeah just like subtle little ways in which I always have to be much more awake I guess in sensing my environment and then I felt that here actually because of the fact that I don't know um Matt and Kenna the two of you as well I was like oh there's like something about the synchronicity of all the environments that I'm enmeshed in right now, kind of having that flavor of unfamiliarity, um, but also kind of waking up again that, oh, what's the territory that we're entering together right now? Um, yeah, yeah, that's how I'm arriving. Nice. Yeah, there's a lot I want to chase down there. But <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of everyone's front and center thing. And before we dive into the more yeah just trading around following the thread just want to remind everyone of kind of the I sent you guys all screenshots in the Twitter chat so it might be a good time to look at that and just keep it on another tab if you can look at it to remind you but the prompts we're kind of working off for today the first one is coming back coming back to embodied ground basically what we 
have talked about what we did at the beginning, that sense of dropping back into yourself, your space, not getting caught up in the head and just talk, 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 idea, idea. Whenever we notice ourselves kind of flying off there, come back, drop in, be here. Prior prioritizing personal experience over ideas. Yeah, check in with each other. How, how do ideas land with people? It's not just about what is that idea, it's what is that idea to you? What is what you just said? Where is that coming from in you, right? Intuitive inquiry towards each other. And then one that Kenna brought in from the improv world, make the other people on stage look as good as possible. Make each other look as good as possible. Fe feed off, keep going, <laughs> follow the threads. Yeah, that's kind of the space we're cultivating here. So I've definitely got a couple things I want to chase up from what was just said, but I want to check in with you guys first. Is there anything you really want to, something someone said that you want to chase down a little further? I want to bookmark the idea that dissonance sharpens metas or risk. I think, mm. um, Cheryl, you said risk or danger, but I um, <clears throat> am interpolating that a little bit into the idea of dissonance, mm. like the unexpected, this book is in unexpected things or sometimes potential threats, like the things that make the hairs on our neck stand up a little bit. Uh, I, I'm bookmarking that because <laughs> that feels really important to me. That's one that I also want to chase down, actually. So let's go, let's go with that. Yeah, <laughs> so, all right. Yeah, that's interesting. The dissonance frame. The Yeah, Cheryl mentioned a draft that I sent her earlier this week where basically I'm noticed, I was noticing threat and like danger seeming to be a part of this. Because, yeah. you know, the examples that I was thinking of were like sailing and hunting and stuff like that where the sea will crush and kill you without caring. If you are hunting something down, there's a bunch of stuff that's also hunting you at the same time, right? You might be hunting the deer, but there's a puma in the tree just waiting for you to slip up, right? And you've got to be open to all of that. And then just personally from my own life, like the most sharpened metis type thing I've ever felt was driving in Hanoi traffic with no helmet and like, just the way that you're open to the way every single thing is moving and how you can slip through the right gaps and sense where everyone is. Another thing I want to bookmark, just how multi-sensory it seems to be. Like every thing where Metis is really involved seems like you have to have so many senses involved. But yeah, I'm curious how that lands with your sense of dissonance. Because to me, like, that feels like a weird, not quite a paradox, but you and Kenna both mentioned like kind of a relaxation and like an easing back to this sense of, oh yeah, there's that openness and metis or yeah, whatever. And I feel that a lot too. And I also look and I'm like, something around threat or danger really sharpens it too. And also doesn't necessarily detract from the relaxation thing with it. It feels very odd to me. So I'm curious what you see there. I, I think it's interesting that you zoomed in on danger. Like, I definitely feel that. And I can relate to that sort of heightened, like all senses on alert in a, in a situation that feels risky. Um, I think the connection with dissonance might be a connection with with trust. When, when Cheryl was talking about what it feels like to be in a hotel that is like deliberately sort of like they're trying to sort of set you up to think that it's home right then there's a kind of a of a sense of like is this real or is this not real can i trust the signals that my environment is giving me do i want to is this a game that i want to play will i go along mm. with this and pretend along with them that this is home <laughs> but <laughs> uh t t this this sort of question it, it 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 overlaps with how do we how do we surf the edge of the familiar and the unfamiliar and, and and that to me that's where the danger comes in because danger is yeah. this absolute confrontation with something that is completely unfamiliar and feels like it threatens our safety but we get there through this like we gradually navigate as we grow and explore our lives and 
travel through all the the fields uh, looking for Kenna's flowers, right? <laughs> Along the way, we're constantly making this decision: do we venture out a little further into the unfamiliar, or do we circle back and spend uh, spend more time, sort of, uh, I don't know, re, re recharging, restoring our batteries in the environment that's familiar. Yeah, I'm curious, Kenna, how some of this lands with you. Because, like, when I was thinking of improv as, like, a form of metis as well, I was like, there's not, like, zero sense of danger to stepping out in front of a crowd of strangers and, like, all right, I have to entertain you guys for 15 minutes, right? How does that yeah. sit? Yeah, and it's funny, Matt, that you bring up trust. Um, there's a, a theater that I perform at, and for a long time, they've had this sort of like sign above the door that you enter through that says trust. And I feel like that's kind of like the <laughs> the ground nice. of being like, okay, I'm trusting the space that I'm entering in. I'm trusting the audience um, that they won't, you know, heckle or boo me or laugh at me in a mocking way. Or I trust that my, the people that I'm performing with that are going to be like, they've got my back and they're not going to let me look like a complete fool out here or things like that. And I think there's a, a sort of strategy when, you know, entering into certain spaces, but I think this works in life in general of like practicing failure and practicing some sort of way to like lose yourself a little bit and go a little crazy for a second and be like, I don't know what that was. That was completely out of nowhere but I'm back to where I am now and hopefully we can like move past it it feels very like like some sort of structured flow and like martial combat almost like judo or like Muay Thai where you're just kind of like getting used to the conditioning of getting tossed around a little bit <laughs> of being like that. okay this is the kiddie pool <laughs> and then once I get into the bigger pool of of life it's like okay I can get tossed around a little bit and I know how to navigate like this. This is life about to like throw me over its shoulder. This is how I can position myself to take the fall and to like land better on my back. That's what first comes up with me. It feels very uh, physical. <laughs> yeah. I love it that trust is written uh, at, at, at a physical mm -hmm. threshold. Like you're literally moving your body from one space to another and you're reminded of that. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm curious something that you just said, the practicing failure and that sense of, yeah, just having a space where it's okay to fail again and again and again. And that seems to generalize for a lot of this stuff, just building, yeah, medicine competence and this like really open, expansive competence. And for me, that connects a lot to like, where is this possible today? And there's very few places that I see the arts and spirituality and sports are like the big three that stand out to me is like yeah there's a lot of space for you to be like playful and fail again and again and keep trying weird things but you know if you go to like your office job or you know I was a teacher for years high school teacher and like there's not a whole lot of room to like hey I'm just gonna like fail and fail at teaching these kids over and over again I'm like I'll get the hang of it eventually we'll figure it out <laughs> no I don't keep the job that long if I do that thing and yeah I'm just where is it like either possible or ideally encouraged to have the space to build metis these days where can that be found It's only just now occurring to me that that's also probably why I was able to find it in Hanoi traffic. Because there's no consequences in Hanoi traffic. I would just crash and bump against people and spin out all the time and like, that was fine. <laughs> and then by the next year or so, I'm just weaving through doing great. But yeah, in American traffic, I would not have had the, the space to be able to do that. <laughs> there's something coming up for me 
around balancing like play with also a sense of high stakes. Mm. And there's something, I, I think maybe because I'm familiar with spaces of play where it can feel very light. Um, yeah, there isn't like, you know, the, it's risk that is quite controlled in an environment. And maybe that's the dojo as well. It's like a, a it's a place that's kind of cultivated to be able to nurture like the moves that you're developing and ways in which you're almost like, yeah, teaching your body to be able to relax into these titrated experiences of risk. Like I remember when I was doing Aikido, it felt like I needed to almost like allow my body to keep falling and falling and bruising and bruising and just be on that brink of as the like that feeling of if I flip I think I'm I'm gonna die like I'm gonna die if I flip in this way and then to just like face that edge and do it and then have your have the body really kind of like know how to keep yeah just feeling what it's like to be at that edge and then it was through that practice that I was able to throw like throw myself into then a project that felt then very high stakes. It was like, oh, I could feel how much the moves I was developing in the practice dojo was kind of thrown into much more of this, um, yeah, like reality, essentially reality. And maybe when you were describing River, like where is the place to practice metis? I was actually just like reality. <laughs> reality is the place to practice metis. Like literally every moment is a moment to practice metis. And I think there's there's something here right now around, like I, I wonder if there's, and I I do this myself as well, like, there's sometimes like a, there's this term, I'm not sure River, if, how you name it, but the psychozoic, it's mm -hmm. like the way that reality is kind of like this hybrid weird, like it's like a weird in this, in the true sense of the word weird, um, blend and like fluid, almost like um, the imaginal and the real are very much intertwined like you're not even when I'm walking through a cityscape yes like streets yes brick walls yes like street lights and then also like how is how is this entire landscape basically designed and architected through the human psyche in its as a collective organism of this is how humans should arrange themselves in space together so it's just like a really, so reality is just a very, um, yeah, it's like depending on how you relate with the mundane and how you meet the everyday, like on your way to a cafe or on your way to work or in the work environment even, um, you can actually, uh, I feel like there's this way in which the metis almost wakes you up to the the hot, like yeah the unfamiliar the unfamiliarity behind the familiar it's just everything is actually weird everything is weird everything is um yeah everything has this like way where you can yeah, this, I'm, I, yeah, I feel like maybe I'm, there's just like, yeah, I think I'm going to stop here, actually. I feel like I'm, <laughs> I'm riffing awesome. it anymore. Uh, there, 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 there's so much here that, that's resonating for me. Um, one association that I have right away is to this interesting book by a philosopher named C, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing his name right, C-T-H-I, Win, N-G-U-Y-E-N. And he wrote a book called Games as the Art of Agency. And part of his thesis is that games, like playfulness, are, are, are a specific kind of human endeavor in which we sort of have to cultivate a double, uh, a, a sort of a double presence in that things must matter immensely and they also must not matter. 
that you know for the for the soccer player on the field who has two minutes left in the game and it's a tie and it's one one it is incredibly important that the ball go in the in the opposing goal but it's also important not to sort of confuse that with sort of a life and death thing to be able to step into the as if mode and be like yes this is so important and i must do this but then you know three minutes later whatever the outcome is the game's over and it's it was just a game and you're back outside of that it makes me think of a particular kind of uh i want to sort of call it a a, a mental move right a, a sideways step from sort of taking things seriously to not taking them seriously and being able to move with ease back and forth between um the the sort of two different worlds that you are describing the world of 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 quote unquote reality and the world of make believe but the two worlds are are shaping each other all the time like that's that's what it feels like to be a human being there's a, yeah there's a really interesting thing there that feels like it overlaps with a lot of McGilchrist's work and what I see in that area the I don't know like a, the sports example let's go with that of like it either matters or it doesn't matter and I see a lot of like collapsing down to one of those of people being aware that those are both options but then choosing to collapse down to one of them when they kind of both need to be present and like wobbling back and forth a little bit because it's easy to like, this game matters more than anything. This game matters more than anything. Oops, I lost. This game didn't matter. It didn't matter at all. <laughs> and both of those seem very just like narrowed. This one, then this one, then this one, then this one. But at least when I've touched something that felt close to meta, <laughs> it's like both of those are just there. And they have to be able to just exist in... Yeah, simultaneous contraposition or whatever. Like they're both just there and it's clear and the paradox doesn't matter internally. <laughs> yeah, and the things that happen in the world of play end up being metaphorically resonant, right? When, when, when uh, Cheryl, when you were sort of talking about Aikido, I was thinking just about the experience of, of trying to do a back, a back arch in yoga and sort of how it feels and that moment of sheer terror that you will <laughs> not, not be able to come back or hurt yourself somehow, but having to face that moment of what feels like immense existential fear, but, but then realizing that that existential fear carries over to all other sorts of existential panic that you might feel as you go about day to life, day to day life, that a that a project you're involved in might somehow fail, or that what, but but recognizing that sort of metaphorical experience that you're building up in the dojo, it it really does like apply. <laughs> That's the right word. Um, there's a kind of metaphorical quality to sort of moving back and forth between the world of quote unquote play and the world of quote unquote reality, which I think is really interesting. Yeah, that, that brings up a question for me of like, what are the kinds of games we can play with reality? Like, what are some fun ways that would be fun for us to to lose or to win at or to have that sort of back and forth? Whether there's a game that you could play with like a barista that you get your coffee from or a game that you can play with yourself in traffic. Um, those little moments of like that, you know, that feeling of you're about to die, about to get tossed over your head, but you don't, you know? And the other question that gets brought up for me is like, what is it like to, to play a game that you know you're gonna win? And what is it like to play a game that you, you might not win, you might lose? And what's it like to play a game that you're completely gonna lose, but screw it, <laughs> you know? <clears throat> yeah one thing that comes up really clearly when you say like i don't know just the way you were talking about games that we can play in the real world is like ideally that's what a good like subculture or scene is is a particular type of game that a bunch of people are like taking quite seriously but also it's not the whole world but also it's your whole world <laughs> And there's, yeah, there's 
10,000 different failure modes for that. But that is one thing that was like really intoxicating about, like I was really big into local music scenes when I was teens, early twenties. And yeah, there was something really intoxicating about that of like, this is a particular type of game and space and I can figure out yeah. what like, what the rules are here. What are the laws here? <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. Hmm. Hmm. I'm also curious about what that mental move would feel like too, of like, you know, I'm kind of moving into like, oh yeah, winning confidence, go, go, go. Ooh, I'm losing, shrinking. Let me pull back or eh, whatever. I'm just going to jive and stay in the middle. Have you read the Bhagavad Gita? I currently have it in my car. I haven't read it. <laughs> okay. I bought it. I was like, I'm going to read this. And then I did that. <laughs> You're bringing up one of my favorite lines from that. Uh... I'm going to butcher it, but like you are entitled to your labor, but not to the fruits of your labor. Uh, and there's something in that whole section yeah. of the poem that's very much about like this. Doesn't matter if you win, doesn't matter if you lose, doesn't matter if you anything, anything, because you don't get the fruits of your labor. None of that is for you. You just get to act how you are going to act to carry out your karma. I love that. Yeah, that has stuck with me. I must have been 19 when I read that. That has stuck with me for over a decade. <laughs> just that sense of, yeah, you don't get the outcomes of your stuff. You just have to do it the way that is best to do it. Which I feel like uh, just going off of the Saruman versus Radagast uh, article of like, Saruman's are really trying to, you know, go, 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 push ahead. Goal directed. Goal directed, make have their cake and eat it too in this lifetime and have to be recognized by all in the present moment at all times uh versus like hey <laughs> it's not gonna matter right now this is okay like you can relax i was just reading something earlier the you guys read pre-conquest consciousness by e richard Sorensen, i think a yes and two no's it's kind of about like older, mostly like pre-agricultural mindsets among like hunter-gatherers and then juxtaposed against modern mindsets. But like, this was one of the things that he brought up around the transition, watching like tribal groups transition from one to the other while in Papua New Guinea, where like this idea of doing things the right way, correctly, getting the right answer, having a goal, achieving it and all that stuff didn't really exist in the like what he calls liminal or pre-conquest consciousness and then it showed up as like the group kind of got modernized or got westernized however it was and yeah it's just interesting to me because i was using that article like i was using anecdotes from that article in a thing i'm writing about metis from completely other sections of the article <laughs> and that one didn't stick out to me a ton until now but yeah, it seems like that's a part of it as well. <laughs> I've got a curiosity we're kind of touching on adjacent here, which is just kind of a general or specific thing, like like metis has to be at something the same way competence has to be at something. There's not just like a generalized, he's a very competent person. At what? Everything, just life, living, existing. <laughs> That's not so much a thing as like, okay, what are you competent at? What are the skills that you've developed? And it seems like, yeah, a lot of metis has to be fairly similar where a lot of it generalizes and you carry yourself differently if you are a master navigator, for example, right? But you have to be a master navigator first. You have to have a thing that you develop metis at. And yeah, I'm just curious if that sounds right or wrong or what to you guys, because I, I just kind of carry that with me and realize I don't know why. 
that it has to be at something. What feels like maybe a, a distinction that could be made is that Metis to me feels like it's in something more intextual. That Metis mm -hmm. is a particular context that you've chosen. That, that, that I mean, there there is no such thing as an infinitely expanded awareness. There's only awareness that reaches all the limits of the things that you've chosen to devote your awareness to. <laughs> and, and the choice of the, sort of those outside boundaries does, I think, shape f for me when I sort of try to think about that distinction, metis versus techni, that that I, I, I am kind of making some choices about what feels most alive and important and vital for me. And maybe metis is sort of developing in a, in a, in a field rather than in like a focused you know yeah. i will be good at i don't know playing soccer or 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 some other arbitrary thing that i'm going to direct my attention towards but metis to me feels like it's it's a way of like uh deepening um cheryl i think you had that beautiful uh, you said something beautiful earlier about sort of putting down roots. It, Metis has that quality of like roots that are steadily spreading under the ground. <laughs> There's something like that that supports the, the tree as it grows and it's sort of more directed towards the sun kind of a way. Mm -hmm. When you were describing, it was, a, I was, yeah, just moving a lot. And then when you're describing the roots, what immediately, like just the image that came through was the best way to describe it is, um, you know, plasma balls. It's like, um, it's often in science centers where it's just, plasma is basically like a gas that's, it's like half, it's not a gas that's not a liquid it's a gas that moves like a liquid and in science centers you it's like a glass orb and then it kind of radiates out from the center and then when you put your finger on it like the plasma starts to move towards your fingers so kids really love it because it feels mm -hmm. like you're you're working with living matter in this really or like a living gas and metis interestingly has almost like imagistically that quality quality to me where yeah like the con I love what you were saying about it feels like it it almost like um there is like an attunement to the context that it's in it's in and there's like a centering in that as well and what I was noticing when I was trying to feel into the various um it's like how to find myself was when I can find a kind of center of place it's like I can I can almost like nest realities around that center more so I can feel the radial quality from my body being center and then it's almost like I know I'm, I feel, I'm not sure if I'm following the rule. Actually, I'm following a rule. I think I'm following the rule of it's based on personal experience, um, but it just feels a little abstract as I'm saying it. It's like when I'm, when I'm really centered in my body and my metis is kind of radiating out like a sphere, it does feel like I'm almost sending out these tendrils of awareness that can reach out really far, maybe closer to like what, James Cars would gesture to as the infinite game. And then there's also ways in which I can be very, very close and very intimately, like, and all of it's intimate. That's the thing. Like even the, even the thing that feels really far when my tendril is reaching out towards a kind of, yeah, it's like, I really love to study stars and I really love to look at images of galaxies and 
what I love about when I look at images of stars and galaxies is when I love when I love looking at an image of a black hole, it's not far away anymore. It's actually very intimate. It's like I've I've almost like pulled this thing that feels very distant, very close to my direct experience. And I think there's like, yeah, where am I trying to go with this? I feel like Metis almost feels like this capacity to attune your consciousness almost like an instrument to different contexts that you're already in all the time. You're swimming kind of like in an ocean of so many contexts. So are you able to almost gather the right context in the right moment in such a way that you feel that quality of mastery in your environment and mastery, not like in this control mastery, but kind of in this like, yeah, it's like this thing is moving through and I can kind of like matrix style. It's like, oh, I can duck around this for some reason right now where I'm dancing with the environment more than I'm trying to force my way through it. Yeah, yeah. That that really resonates with me, that 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 feeling of metis is a process of sifting. Like maybe there's a there's a lot out there, but but the more centered I feel gradually, the better I become at at sort of pinpointing these smaller things that are out there that that seem related to the more central activity or process that I'm engaged in that 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 feels that feels like a good description to me of metis mm. love the kind yeah. of box of like tendrils going outward <laughs> and i i have similar imagery when i am teaching and performing for children in particular because I feel like children have so much like they have a deep rich inner world that they quite don't know yet and they have so much and even now I'm starting to get like a little yeah I don't know how to describe it shimmers again um, but it is so like you kind of get like it's hard to describe because it's almost I'm here performing I'm here teaching for this group of children while they're kind of absorbing whatever you're talking about but I can also kind of feel like, oh, I can see the jokes. I can kind of see the them also mm -hmm. being imprinted by your words and how they're kind of interpreting it and how I can see that move from like group to group to class to class and see how like memes and humor and what really sticks into what their kind of brains absorb is like really interesting. But yeah, it's like a space in between. There's like so many like uh i don't know almost like dust <laughs> that kind of connects mm. us all in that way where i'm like mm. okay i can just collect the dust or like lightning in a bottle moments of just like oh i've got this little lightning in a bottle here at least to me yeah what i'm you brought up the plasma balls and you just finished with lightning in a bottle and like the image that was coming up for me when i'm trying to feel through what Cheryl was describing was very lightning like where essentially yeah what it felt like is like your intention kind of lines up with the intention of the whole situation around you and there's a lot of possible paths for it and then in the moment when it like connects it just yeah the way that lightning just like could take many many paths between the sky and the ground but when the moment happens and the spark hits, it just takes the one that it does and instantly is there. That's the feeling that I was getting listening to a lot of this of just, yeah, your open aware and yeah, your open awareness of like the situation and context around you lines up and collapses like your intention and the situation's intention into one and just you do, you do. You tell the joke, you say the thing, you, <laughs> whatever it is. Yeah. It's receptivity and intention, but it's a particular kind of flexible intention. Mm. It's the knowledge that you have a direction. You're not, or there might be a target that you've chosen that you're moving towards, but you haven't necessarily foreclosed how you're going to get there to any one path. And if you wait with the right kind of receptive attention, then the 
path can be suddenly clear. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. Mm. It reminds me, I don't know where this, yeah, it's something that's coming up is like reality wants to encounter you. And I, what I love about electricity or lightning is if you see a slow motion image of the way like a lightning bolt hits the ground, it's actually electricity from the ground meeting electricity coming from the sky. Nice. So it's not like this one way, it's a meeting point. Um, and I think because I was picturing, River and I will talk a lot. He, he got me to watch um, Moana. <laughs> And now I just go to Moana every time I think about Mattis. It's just, just like the film. And I really love uh, just like, what would it, what is it like to be, yeah, you don't have your phone. You, you're really navigating through your extended distributed sensing organ with your environment. Like if you're on an ocean and trying to navigate a boat like it's hard for me honestly it's so hard for me to imagine like the closest is when I go camping um but there's there is this way in which yeah maybe it, just to ground it in direct experience it's like when I go camping and I can drop a kind of structured pattern of reality away it's like time doesn't have to be linear. I don't have to live by my calendar. I don't have to know what I'm doing next all the time. There is this way in which like every encounter, like when I find, when I meet a tree and I'm like, oh, this tree, it's like that tree wants to meet me. Or when I notice a star, it's like, oh, that star wants to meet me. And that contact point is a moment of trust because then suddenly my salience landscape is almost like co-determined by not only what I'm choosing to direct my attention to, but by the realities that the reality that's also trying to make contact with me. And I think maybe that's a difference where like my sense is the kind of liminal consciousness isn't, oh, I'm trying to hold the whole all the time. It's that mm. you kind of make yourself available, like a receptor site to having reality meet you. And then like, perhaps like the navigation is, oh, for some reason I'm noticing, like, why am I, you don't even have to question it. It's like, I'm just noticing the flavor of the salt in my mouth, or I'm noticing the direction of this wind. And then your body will just move. Like you don't have to think about it. You, mm. Your body will just kind of do the thing that needs to be done to meet reality i love yeah. that phrase salience landscape <laughs> that, mm, yeah uh, yeah because it's flexible depending on the kind of attention you give to what's around you the salience landscape will will shift that's really nice yeah and you're, you're dipping towards the suspicion i have that like metis is basically tends towards animism like you mm. follow metis far enough and it just becomes animistic because they're joined at the hip or something even yeah. like modern examples like sailors are constantly like referring to their boat as a person and the sea as a person artists never stop talking about finding some way to bring up like the muse or something that is like coming to them meeting them giving to them from the outside Athletes are notoriously superstitious about stuff. <laughs> like, it just seems like there's something deep in, I don't know, they're both downstream of something towards seeing the world as inescapably alive. Yeah, and that's right hemisphere territory. They yep. connect back to McGilchrist, and he makes that distinction very clear. The right hemisphere of the brain is adapted specifically for navigating living situations with other living beings in them. It's a left mm -hmm. hemisphere that is sort of the playground of a more uh, deterministic, the universe is a machine and we are all machines making machines. That's 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 a left hemisphere delusion, frankly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, there's a, 
the more I look into meta stuff, the more it like, I just keep finding more right hemisphere stuff <laughs> that pops out. And what yeah. you just said, I found another article on Metis a bit ago that was, yep, we can understand Metis as embodied intelligence in action, fit for uncertain times, ambiguous spaces, and unequal dynamics. And yeah, again, it's all about navigating dynamic, alive things with your active, intelligent body. It's just all right hemisphere stuff, it seems like. So it's really nice one to of find the, like a frame. One of the intriguing, I think, to me, consequences of, of all McGilchrist's work is that I, I think what he really is telling us is that we can actually choose to imbue life to our surroundings. And this connects with the animism of what you were saying, which is that it is a choice that has consequences. That if I am out there in a natural landscape on a hike and I choose to believe that the rocks and the trail and the cliff and the trees and the possible animals out there all have a kind of interconnected life to them, including the rocks, including <laughs> it's a choice mm -hmm. that I can make, but it is a choice that will change my salience landscape. It is a choice that will change what I see. It was a choice that will change the way that I interact with all of those things. And that, that, that to me is really intriguing. There's a kind of alchemy possible. Um, yeah. Mm. <laughs> it does feel like that's one of the biggest leverage points. Like, if you're looking for one weird trick to find, like, metas and right hemisphere engagement and whatever, whatever, it seems like one of the furthest upstream things you can do is just like, okay. The world is dynamically alive and persistently sacred in all of its iterations. Go. <laughs> Keep going from that and you'll find everything else. Yeah. I, I want to add one more layer to that, which is one of the things that I find really intriguing, which is that not only can we choose to imbue life to the things that other people might not see as living, right? But but to varying degrees, we imbue life in the human beings who are around us. And and this is sort of a, the connection that I'm feeling here uh, is with Kenna, the way that you sort of talk about the way that you relate to the kids that you teach. Like not every teacher fully imbues their students with life. Like not every teacher sees them fully as sort of receptive, co-creating beings who have inner lives of their own that you're like interacting with. Like that, that, that's a wonderful thing. <laughs> and that's so cool. But, but it, it, to me, it kind of also brings up this question of like, uh, like in day to day life and interactions with other human beings around us, like, are we really fully imbuing them with life? Or is there, are we just sort of waltzing past the barista and <laughs> treating them as if they're like a coffee dispensing machine uh, as we go about our daily routine? Mm. I've noticed there's been like great rewards that come with like noticing the small details where the life is at within something. And Cheryl, you talked about kind of like moving through life, like you're bringing your human psyche into the present moment, into the world of kind of like you're this architect and alchemy comes along with that as well, where it just feels like you're outstretching whatever comes forth from your mind out to the world. And it's like, all right, I'll meet you where you're at for like some sort of cosmic fist bump of like, <laughs> here's this beautiful thing that you would never would have seen or would never would have happened if you would have just outstretched your hand, uh, kind of in that mm. same lightning analogy there, where yeah. it's like, oh, yeah. they're both kind of meeting here. It's like, oh, cool. All I had to do was just reach out my hand and here's this beautiful little moment. Here's this little thing of connection of life in this kind of space. It's really I don't know. The word dope comes to mind. <laughs> cosmic fist bump. That's definitely, it's imprinted now. <laughs> I'm calling it cosmic mm -hmm. fist bump. Yeah, I actually, I wanted to pick up, Matt, what you were uh, highlighting around, can I, you like your vibe? I wanted to actually take a moment to like really uh, notice a name that you kind of you we were talking a little we were talking about kind of the maybe like the higher stakes or the danger or the risk 
But when I feel into the vibe of what kind of arises as you're speaking, and especially when you're talking about your teaching of the kids and the guidance of the kids, like I can actually feel like a vital ingredient gradient of friendliness with reality as well. And just like the way that, um, I don't know, it's like when, and it's interesting because like metis maybe has this because it's like a, an, a Greek word from, <laughs> I don't know, it just has like a kind of, you have to train and attune your metis. And then I also <laughs> really like when we can look at children and just like remember that children do it all the time and they don't mm -hmm. think about it. And there's something around like the training is actually around a kind of unlearning. It's like coming back to something that we've already known how to do. It's kind of, it's part of our primal nature. It's like when, and you also can just learn from children. Like you don't have to necessarily like go to some kind of grand master to figure it out. Like you can just look at the way kids create games like instantly and they scare themselves. Like, they get scared of the monster in their closet and that's high stakes. Like, it's like, no, there is something in my closet, I swear. And it's scary. And then also maybe the next day they're like friends with the monster and they're hiding in the closet playing with the monster. So it's like a very, yeah, I think there's, there's this way of, uh, yeah. How do you, how do you work with that? like the cat that just like that childlike capacity but also bring a kind of adult uh discernment to it as well um there's something kind of in the combination I guess yeah there's there's so much within like really being with children and really kind of like meeting them on their level um, and performing for them too. And I think, honestly, as someone who's performed for children of many ages and has done tons of shows, like they're the best audience members to have because they'll <laughs> they'll tell you immediately when they like something or when they don't like something. They're like, I don't know. To me, I imagine like you old tavern, like a bunch of just drunks, but they're all toddlers <laughs> and they're just enjoying whatever, you know, they have going on. But there's also a level of like realness too that is like, I'm here to teach and I'm here to, you know, hopefully that y'all can come around with the idea of what I'm trying to impart on you. And hopefully my wisdom, you know, will last until, you know, the rest of your life or however long that you might need it. But it's like, oh, I'm, I'm still a human at the end of the day. Like, I'm not just a, you know, a teaching dispenser or <laughs> some sort of person who's here to enforce some sort of rules that you have to be here and you have to sit down and do this and raise your hand. It's like, no. There's multiple different ways of access. And I think that comes across a, as well of like access and how can we access each other? Uh, when I'm working with children, it's like, yes, we can raise our hand, but also you can call things out. That's that's fine and valid too. As long as it's like, you know, not super disruptive or if we just want to stand up and move your body and, you know, want to express it in this way or in this way, just to get the full embodiment of is my knowledge, whatever I'm teaching really resonating in your bones. And always at the same time, it's like, I'll let them know straight up like, hey, I'm not feeling it today. I'm sick, I'm losing my voice. I'm tired, I'm sleepy. <laughs> you know, I'm in the same boat as you, man. But we can mm. hopefully, you know, imbue each other with enough energy, enough life to like have fun and play and, you know, do whatever needs to be done. Um, and I, it feels very like musical to me. I get very like, there's like rhythm and tempo and uh, movement. And Cheryl, you brought up dance and kind of moving through that. There's there's a lot of physicality that comes with that that is like sensed and like call and response and within sort of like weaving through and navigating kind of like these waters together and like, hey, I kind of have an idea of what my end result is at the end of the day, but hopefully whatever y'all can take from it is like just as important as it is to me. Hopefully that makes sense. It sounds like madness when I am <laughs> speaking aloud sometimes. Sounds like wayfaring. You're sort of using some of the metaphors that resonate with things River talks about. That sounds awesome. 
I, I love that you bring up wayfaring because that's been like, I don't know, a word that's been like chirping in my ear for the past like month. And I'm like, I don't have no clue what wayfaring is. Why do you keep <laughs> telling me this word? And I like look it up and be like, Ugh. but thank you. I see this big smile on River's face while you were talking. <laughs> <laughs>